All right. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. As you heard, I'm Alex Norton. This is Nathan Hall. Um, I'm the lead designer of Fluffy Knuckle Duster. Nathan is the lead developer. This is Benson, our morale consultant. He's really good because sometimes when you're just a team of two people, you do something really cool and you just really need a crisp high five. Who gets things for us? Anyway. We're Fluffy Knuckle Duster. We're trying to do a little bit of a... It started out as a social experiment and then sort of became too fun. We um, wanted to see if two people who are both driven enough and both into their particular field enough can make a game just on their own and make it actually decent, not fight, not argue, not have huge big conflicts about how the process works and, and whether or not it can work. And uh, we're here to tell you about WizDoff, the first game that we've made using the system. So, we're at the end of development now. Got delayed a little bit due to some technical limitations that we found that the app had. Side note, developing entirely on Android devices and then trying to get it working on iOS at the last minute, not necessarily the best way to go. But you live, you learn, hindsight's 2020. But whizzed off, the game's finished now, it's, it's ready, we're just in the final stages where we're about to push it out do the Apple release first, wait a month or so, do the Android release. Uh, so, to give you an idea of what the game looks like, uh, we'll show you the trailer. Benson, trailer. Maximize. That's, that's the gameplay footage, Benson. Drag it onto the other screen. Come on, Benson. You got this. We talked about this. Now you got to drag it to the other screen, Ben. He's new, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to close it. Escape. No, that's the wrong screen, Ben. <laughs> Pause the video. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Drag it onto the other screen. You got this. We'll have words later. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Now, full screen. Good luck. You, can do it. You, nearly, you nearly did it, Benson. All right, play. That's it. Aren't your pets so good to see? The mad wizard is at it again. Many dangerous foes await you. Also, gassy ones. Sorry, no, sorry. Wizda! You can't get another part, you know? There you go. So that's, that's Wizda. Benson, PowerPoint. It's going to autoplay. You better be quick. Get a jump in that step, Benson. Cancel it. Too late. It's on the screen. Benson. Benson, come on. Over here, come on. Where are we going? Where are on the right. Go to the right of the screen. Oh, there you go. There's your cursor. Up here. Yeah, click the window. No, click here, click here, window. just click there, click. Come on, Benson. Do I click it? Oh, we might as well play this now. <laughs> <laughs> it's slowly it's loading, though. Yeah, click it, click it. This is some gameplay footage to you give you an it? idea. Okay. Well, you failed now, Benson. We might as well roll with it. Come on. Play. Hit the window. Just click in the screen. Anyway's fine. <laughs> So how we started was that Alex 
wanted to start branching into mobile games after uh, his PC release, uh, Malevolence. And he was doing a talk, and one of my mates went up to him afterwards, hearing about him wanting to go into mo mobile development, and Alex has been wanting to find someone who couldn't necessarily be paid full-time, you know, he Share wanted to just try this, just ha have to be driven on passion and do this as much as they could. Another big point was that I wanted somebody to do the code for me, because mm. on my PC title, Malevolence, I was doing the code and the design, and I, I loved the game design portion of things. Coding, I could, I could do without having two major projects, so I wanted to find a solid mobile coder. And uh, my friend passed on my name, and I got in contact with Alex, and Alex said, here's a design of one of my ideas, take a few days, make a prototype, see what you can do. It was and a very intensive interview process. Yes. No questions about who he was, I just wanted to see his code. Yeah, and he, he got me to do that, and I sent back what I, what I did, and he gave me a list of things to change, just to test if he, he would just annoy me with how detailed he got in, into just how fussy he was. It was and a long Skype call. It was a long Skype call, and I did my best, and he seemed to be happy with it, and uh, we wanted to just see if we got in on, on each other's nerves in the process, and the rest that's, is history. that's it. Yeah, that's it. So we started uh, straight onto this. So he showed me a, pro a prototype that he had done, and we got straight into this after he uh, did the design document. The proof of concept at this point was just boxes and, and spheres on the screen. We wanted to make sure that the, the mo movements was right, that the game was fun in that basic, core, untextured, unsound concept prototype. Very, very basic. My idea was if it, if it isn't fun when you can't really see what's going on on the screen, if it's just basic shapes, it's not going to be fun when it's all polished up. Uh, and that's basically where the, the prototype was sitting. So that led to finding Nathan, and then I, uh, we built up a design document that we went over very, very thoroughly and sort of gave, gave this idea of this little physics simulation, which was kind of like a uh, joust. You remember yeah. the old arcade game Joust? It was a bit of a reimagining of that. Um, however, in Joust you had a very large screen and if you flew off one side of the screen you'd come into the other side of the screen and, and vice versa. But on a mobile device you don't necessarily have the large screen to convey that sense of infinite horizontal travel um, because you'd be flipping across the screen so quickly. So we found out we could do the same thing. You might have noticed the rotating tower. Uh, it, it, essentially does the same thing. Your character always stays in the center and the sense of motion happens in the background moving. Um, th that's all the prototype was. It was a, a round cylinder with a box moving around it and every time you hit the space bar it would flap and left and right would pick which direction you were actually flying in. Yeah. And, and so we built a story around it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, in Joust it was just if you were higher up than the enemy then you would beat it but because the screen's so uh, thin uh, you can't really tell what's going to be right over. You can't plan your movement, so we had to make sure that everyone was planning it out and not taking it too too fast. So you had to slow down to and line up your, your shot on top of the enemy and get a straight on top hit. Yeah, the entire so, mechanic of the game is you've got to if you want to kill an enemy, you've got to bop them on the head. Except you're travelling up the tower and the enemies are coming down, so you have to navigate around them and bop them on the head. If they touch you on the head, then they hurt you. So we just needed to control the speed through that way, and that was the core of the, the core of the game. Yeah. So that was basically the plan. We wanted that design document to be thorough from beginning to end. A lot of um, projects. I mean, the, we had the idea that we were told you about earlier of just two people working on a game. A lot of the time, anybody that's ever worked on a group project of any kind, usually there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians, and you end up running rampant with all these people wanting to pitch in ideas and all that sort of thing. And the, the, the core idea of a game can warp and shift and change throughout the development cycle. We wanted to have a solid design document, and the goal was to stick to it. So we actually took quite a bit of time to thoroughly describe it. And I'm happy to say that we can actually look back at the original design document that we typed up 14 months ago and it matches the final product to a T. It's quite quite amazing. I didn't think we'd actually do it. No. <laughs> I, 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 was the, the, I, I was the one who started the plan and I still didn't think I'd do it, but Nathan is fantastic to work with, so we haven't had a single argument the entire time for 14 months of working on a video game project. It's been amazing. Um, it doesn't so, happen. No. <laughs> But we, just, we, we stuck to the plan, we didn't surprise each other with changes. There were changes at one point. We actually nearly had the game done in September last year, and then John Passfield came out of the works and said, this is fantastic. I would do this, 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 and this. 
you don't ignore John Passfield when he tells you things about your game project. So we went to the design document. We 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 spent a good two or three days just sort of yeah. working in little things and how we could change those aspects without actually compromising the, the product and, and figuring out the new time schedule that would be going and it was longer than we thought but yeah. you know, we needed these things in because and we didn't think of it prior to that there were solid ideas and it's it's made the game something really beautiful I mean I, I play it every day I'm just not sick of it I don't get sick of it um, Nathan probably does because he has to look at the code <laughs> I play it and I just find that's a bug that's work that's what always sees as bugs I just see pride when I play it and I, I, it's nice to actually have that at the end of a project um, but yeah I mean discussion was a big thing we would not change the design document we wouldn't deviate from the design document without mutual agreement for both of us and that was the, the plan from the, the beginning I mean anytime Nathan had an issue with something he would bring it up with me and vice versa uh, it, it, it did lead to quite uh, quite a bit of respect for each other because you have to remember I had never met Nathan before this the first day that I met him I gave him a programming task and said you better impress me and it, that, that's work, where we started and we, we started our colleagues and we ended up quite close friends actually we mm. see each other quite a lot especially if you're going to have laughter and fun as like the base of your your brand you've got to be comfortable around each other and be able to have your inside jokes and be able to you know pump that into the game yeah just come up with an idea and feel free to just throw that out there and know that you know the other person's probably going to find that funny it can't be just like I wrote a joke have a look yeah, yeah. That you only have to, to only have to look at the fluffy knuckle duster branding for five minutes to see that we're very humour based. We have twenty more games in the pipeline already designed, documented up, and they're all incredibly humorous. Mm. Um, and we we plan on sticking to that. If if it makes us laugh, we figure it must be a good idea. And if it makes us laugh on paper, it's going to be even funnier if we execute it correctly with the, the right graphics, the right sound. Um, you probably heard a lot of fart noises and big green gas clouds and things in in Wizdoff. And fart humour is crude, but it makes you laugh. I, I love handing over my phone to people when, when they say, oh, you're working on a game, and then just watching them lose because they were laughing so hard. That's, that's a really great feeling as a designer. Um, so if I think something's funny and Nathan doesn't, Nathan tells me so, and vice versa. And we know each other well enough to not get upset about that. I mean, if we can't both agree on something, that's just not worth pursuing. Yeah. So that's what the original prototype looked like. It's come a long way, as you can see, comparing it to the, the trailer. Um, Minecraft textures. <laughs> a ball, some spikes in Minecraft textures. Yeah. It was just getting the movement right was the base of that prototype. Like, just having that out there was just a glaring fact that if this movement isn't right, it's not going to feel good to play the game with all the extra features in it. So that's... Until we get that right, we can't move forward. I mean, you can have all the pickups and, and um, power-ups and all that sort of thing in a game that you want, but if it's not, the core mechanic isn't fun, then you're stuck from the beginning. Um, so we got it feeling nice there and just stuck to that for the entire project and everything else was, if it didn't, if it, if it grated on that in some way, we just dropped it. So when it came to the style and the design side of it, it was mainly written out first. I had no idea what the end result was going to look like and I had a, a friend of mine who had worked on Malevolence in the past who was a voice actor and she just started doing artwork and she did this really obscure funny little characters that just made no sense physically and all that sort of thing and, and she'd been putting them on Facebook and I was quite enamored by them and so I, I thought I'd test her just by writing it out as uh, the description I gave her was I, I really want the creatures of this to look like bowling balls with tiny little limbs dangling off them, with wings that are just big enough to carry it. And they, that's how they fly, just sort of flapping along. And she ended up coming up with this array of creatures that just cracked me up. She'd send me a new one and I'd get really excited. I'd open the email and I'd be on a bus or something and just <laughs> start snorting out. Just hilarious. And this one here, this is called the Splug. Just chronic flatulence, constantly. And it's how it actually gets around in the game. It's it's its means of locomotion. Um, and if if it, if I have that reaction the first time I see it, what's uh, you know somebody that's actually getting to play it and see it move? I mean, I was seeing a still picture of it. Getting to actually animate it was great. And purely, the main thing she was after was you know getting the same aesthetics from the Splug, the original one, 
and just making sure that every single enemy was a distinct colour, a distinct shape, because they all move and behave differently. So you need to instantly know exactly what you're about to face. Yeah. And purely going off that, she created the look and feel of the entire game. When you first start out playing, the game moves very slow, it's very paced, and you can really get a chance to see the detail on the monsters, but after a while, it starts getting more intense, and more and more monsters are there, and you start moving so fast that you really need to be able to distinctly identify each type of monster, because each one reacts differently. Splugs fart, and their farts are toxic. Um, the hunter hawks in the top right corner there swoop at you from above, and they have a distinctive cry that if you hear it, it means it's about to swoop down on you. Uh, these little rocky looking guys explode when you land on them, so you've got to bounce on one and then get the hell out of there, otherwise you'll get caught in the explosion. Uh, but if you're moving really, really fast and whizzing around this tower and everything's moving on the screen, it's those big primary colours that really set you off and make you go, oh, I, I know instinctively what that's going to be, so I know how to react to it. And I'm a, I, I, I come from an era of playing on the uh, video games on the PS1, like, Abe's Odyssey and, and Crash Bandicoot where you will quite happily sit there and play a level 20, 30, 40 times and just keep dying again and again and again until you work it out. And I've sort of worked that into the design of this. It gets hard quickly, but you can play it at your pace. The tower has a fixed height, which doesn't really show on the trailer, but once you play it you'll realise after a while of flying upwards you'll get to the top. The higher you are in the tower, the more difficult the game is, but the higher the reward is. So if you want the high scores, you've really got to take big risks or spend hours grinding at the bottom. Because um, near the bottom of the tower, all the slow-moving monsters are there and uh, little single gold coins that you can pick up occasionally. And you don't have too much variation, just enough to like get you interested, but yeah. if you want like a whole lot of different types of gameplay, you need to go up higher. It's self-paced learning, essentially, because I mean, you need a, a certain amount of that in a video game. We get a lot of people that um, have played the game while we've been running at past all census groups and play testers and the way people play it is very different sometimes to yeah. what you expect. Some people just crazily flap until they get to the top of the tower and then just get annihilated and go, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, but then they play, we'll, we'll try and stay silent and then they'll play it again and then you get that, ah, it's, we just wait for it now. The, the, the eventually they'll play again and then the, the ah moment always happens and they figure out, oh, I'm going to go down on them. I see. When I bop them on the head, that's when I... Okay, ah. And then you've got to fight them for the phone back because people have been getting really addicted to the game, which is nice. It's always a good We had that one kid that was playing for like six hours. Yeah. Um, the whole of the Game On thing. Game On. Back. Yeah. Se uh, August last year? September last yeah. year? Yeah. This one kid stayed at the booth, just hogged the device. We had to pull out a charger for it and plug her in <laughs> so that she could keep playing. And <laughs> it just would not get off the device. Yeah. Uh, was pushing for the high score. It was nice to see. And then John Passville came by, played it once, and beat their high score. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a gamer. Yeah. Um, so, when going into this, because I'm straight out of uni basically, I was out for after graduation for a couple of months but before getting sna snatched up by this guy. And uh, through the project and my own personal work, I've always been using Unity, and it's more of just a comfort zone. If I'm going to go from making PC kind of central games into mobile development, I kind of just want to expand on what I'm used to. So for the first learning experience of the game, I wanted to stick to something I'm I'm used to, even though it might have more overhead than I'm I'm planning on. It's just something for time constraints, you might just have to deal with that. And for future ones, we might look at. Uh, you know, Unreal, see how that's going, or go into something completely different, and uh, it's worked out pretty pretty well for us. This file size is a bit bigger than Good we'd community. like to. Good community, yeah. If you've got any issues, then Unity's brilliant for that. Like, there's so so many uh, answered questions, and easy to just get onto them. Really, um, it's worked really well for us. And for social media and in-app purchases and uh, or not, we've gone with uh, third-party plugins. We mainly wanted to go for Prime 31. That seemed to be the kind of consensus of, you know, these guys have been established for a bit, and they, they do really well. Um, you know, bit bit pricey, but it works. But their uh, social interactions with you, uh, you know, customer service are not very great. So I didn't want to go fully into there, just in case things went haywire. And so I went with uh, Push Push for the 
uh, notification system, which worked great for local notifications. Yep. Um, iOS nothing, has their own, which we used. Instead. Yeah, uh, it was a bit iffy going on uh, sending out a wide online notification, but we didn't really need that for this title. Um, and we did find that Prime 31, we did, did have an issue with it, and it was very hard to get a clear response from them. Um, but otherwise, it has been working pretty well. So it's it's really kind of a do your research with the plugins, and if you've got two different third-party plugins, often they'll try and override each other uh, with like Android manifests and building the program. Um, they'll want to try and override each other, and you've got to really kind of sort that out, uh, or else it just won't work, and you've got to try and figure out why. So tracking down one bad line in the manifest can be a bit of a pain. Yeah, it's a big management system if you've got so many different third parties, so try and keep it consistent. Um, now to a lot of people in the audience who have done mobile games and have been doing mobile games, all of this may seem very, very basic. We have to understand that we both came from PC and this is our first foray into mobile, yeah. so a lot of this is very new ground for us and we're kind of learning as we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <coughs> starting out the project, we had two ways of doing it. We don't have an office, we don't have salaries, we don't have work equipment, we use all our own equipment, we work from our homes and we're trying to keep our overheads to basically nil, nothing that we wouldn't be paying anyway, internet bills, food, electricity um, and any expenses that we incur if it's on the design side of the business, it's me, so silicone wristbands and flyers and things and if there's plugins, software that needs happening then that's Nathan's side of it and it's up to him to handle it himself. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way we operate. And the same goes for our dev days. Um, we don't live together. We live on opposite ends of town. Um, and we do all of our communication with Skype, basically. Yeah. And uh, Simple stuff. Yeah, it's it's very handy. Um, me being a programmer as well, sometimes I can I can work with Nathan on, on code or if he's working on something that he's saying, is this laid out correctly in the actual window? He can screen share with me. It's nice and easy. It's just like having him sit next to me does get a little tricky with some of the more moving things. Yeah, so Australian internet gets very, you know, hard to keep up with the frames, so Neither sometimes we do need NBN to do... areas. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we do need to do the in-person dev days just to get that design stuff, like, I'll need Alex to sit and just sit there, here are the things to change the movement, just do it yourself. Yeah. And getting getting him in on those code, those coding side of things, it's, it's hard to do purely remotely. He knows how picky I am. I'll sit there and say, this menu needs to come in faster, 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 faster. Too fast, slower, too slow. Faster, but slower. Slow, but, yep, that's it. <laughs> now, if we were to do that remotely, that takes sending bills back and forth or trying to screen capture it and then send a video and it gets fussy. So we'll have days where I will turn up at an obscene hour in the morning mm. and then leave at an obscene hour in the evening and we'll just work through. We'll bulk buy candy and... and Bacon and eggs, bacon and, and eggs hand for breakfast, and coffee, and and set us off for the day. And we just nose to the screen, work, and we we save up items. We, you'll see here we use Trello for our our um, project management. We we've, we've tried a few different project management tools like Asana and things like that. just overcomplicated a lot things of features for what we're but doing. Not yeah. laid out well enough. We found our system was simple. We have a fixed number of columns in Trello. We have items that we haven't started yet, items that Nathan's working on, items that I'm working on, items that have been roadblocked by something and we'll get to later, ready for testing and then done. Or and save for a dev day. Or like, save, there's another one, yeah, we started putting in one for save for a dev day because some items just, like refining menu movements cannot be done remotely. It has to be done in person. Um, and we found that actually worked quite a lot. Dropbox was great for transferring builds back and forth, and um, so far it's, it's worked fantastically well. Uh, Australian internet aside, sometimes Nathan would just have to leave an upload going overnight and say, oh, I just checked the Dropbox in the morning, I'm sure it'll be there. It'll use, be there about two days later. Use carrier pigeon, put it on a memory stick and carry it. <laughs> it might be just faster. Carry. We do have a Benson, <laughs> but his legs get really tired after the first couple of Ks. He starts <laughs> complaining, you don't want to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> We're saving up to get him some Nikes, but we haven't decided whether or not that comes out of the technology yeah. side or the graphic design <laughs> side. It's, so, it's aesthetically pleasing. I think that's your area. Yeah, I guess, but you know, we've had this discussion. We'll yes. do this later. <laughs> a big thing when you are working 
separately. I mean, there's just the two of us. That's that's the thing that sort of this revolves around, and a big part of that is keeping morale up, and that's why we have our morale officer. Mm. Um, but we have these company morale days where we'll basically just say we're not talking about game dev. We're just going to go out and we're going to socialize like normal human beings, and we'll go to a pool halls, games, arcades, uh, places like that. We had a picnic once, mm. and just. It was nice. Put out a spread. <laughs> and we just will turn off, yeah. switch off. It might turn into a small discussion about something, but it's never really a serious, all right, we need to figure out what we're doing. Oftentimes we'll find we'll end up discussing future projects yeah. at great length. Yeah. Um, because we, it, it's basically just, there's hope in future projects, you know? Yeah. But when you're at the end of a long project that you've been working on for a long time, the hope starts dwindling. Uh, but <laughs> future projects are much more exciting, yes. uh, which is why we have about 20 lined up, just because we keep going, that'd make a great game idea. So it's nice not to keep everything business related or professional. It's nice to relax and feel like you're working with someone that you want to, you like working with and you're doing this out of passion. Just this <laughs> morning we were playing with a kitten. Yes, got a brand new kitten. Brand new kitten. Little black thing, it's adorable. <laughs> Uh, but that's it's important to keep that morale up because you'll all know that the last one percent of a project takes ninety nine percent of the work. I mean, anybody that's done game dev knows that, and everyone that's done game dev is inwardly groaning, thinking of horrible, horrible memories of that. Uh, morale's the same when you're in that polish stage where the project's done, but it's not refined yet, and you're just everything's done. All you have to do is hit the release button, and you can just be done with it, be out of your life. But you just don't want to release it like that. It's not it's not dressed yet. That stage can go on a long time and morale starts to dwindle and you've got to keep it up. And so. me coming straight out of uni, um, jumping straight into this, it was, uh, you know, straight out of uni you want to try and get an industry job and um, see where you can work. But I started my own projects just to keep something on resumes and whatnot. And then Alex uh, came along and I just thought, yeah, I kind of want to keep going with the group projects. I want to be driven by someone who else who has the design in their head and you know, I get my morale just working by myself dwindles because I start doubting whether an idea was good or not. But if it's someone who's not looking at all the code and all the bugs and it's just my design is coming to life and I've made uh, the animations are coming to life and everything's really exciting. It's nice to to have that to keep you going. Company cheerleader. Yeah. And as much as I, as an industry job would be great, I've been doing this has forced me to learn everything by myself and make the mistakes and force you to learn a lot better than I feel like I would learn otherwise. Uh, if you learn through mistakes, then you're definitely going to learn a, a lot easier. And it's been slower, but I think it's working a lot better, to be honest, and, you know, I wouldn't do another, any of that. <coughs> the good thing with Wizzed Off is that we, we didn't set a date, we just said we'll, we'll release it when it's done, this is going to be the trial to see if this system works, um, whether or not mobile games are for us, even, mm. because, I mean, I had malevolence, it was a, you know, harrowing experience in itself, but very rewarding, but mobile games are totally different animals to PC games, just completely. Uh, that the audiences are different, the expectations are different, the design of control systems co just go completely rethink everything and throw it out the window. I mean, just this simple fact of adding an accelerometer to the mix is just very, very different. I know virtual reality and things are starting to come into the PC market, but it's all very new, and and it, it's a relearning everything even for me after after doing what I've done. It's, it's <coughs> I can't imagine what it was like for somebody coming fresh out of uni. And I didn't start just, I, I didn't stop just looking for jobs because, you know, I still have to work. I still have to work basically full time to pay off bills, but uh, you got to keep active. And that's really what I started off working with Alex to do, to keep something going. Because you don't, you don't go out of uni and then just like, all right, job time. It's, you got to keep working, keep, keep yourself fresh, learn new things and keep adding things to the resume. And you know you don't stop looking, looking, but it's you got to keep active, and this is a very good way to do it. And you know it's been working out. So 
when it came to promotion of this one, I really wanted to steer away from um, relying on people who know me from Malevolence. I wanted to separate this. And so, different market anyway, which was good, but I already had a lot of contacts with um, Let's Play channels, magazines, that sort of thing, and, and that has helped. But the biggest difference with promoting a mobile game is uh, versus a PC game is with a PC game you can build hype. You can have the trailers there, the launch dates, all that sort of thing. People get excited for it, they bookmark it, they add it to their wish lists and things like that. Mobile games, if you say to somebody, oh, I'm working on a mobile game, they go, they pull out their phone and they're like, oh, cool, which one? It's like, oh, no, it's not in the, the app store yet. And like, oh, cool, that's great. <laughs> Gone, you lost them. They'll never hear it from you again. Um, if they can't pull it out, download it, and be playing it by the time you've finished describing what the game is, they don't give a damn anymore. So I've got all of this, this stuff sort of waiting in the wings. All these people know about the project but haven't been given the, 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 you know, the media kit yet or anything like that because if I start advertising uh, Fluffy Knuckle Duster and Whizzed Off before we actually have something that they can solidly go out and download, nobody's going to care about it. I'll miss my shot. Because if I, if somebody hears about it and it's not available and then they hear about it later, they're going to go, oh yeah, that game, I already know about that. The curiosity's gone. There's no, no way you're going to draw them in to actually go and download it. The big thing you've been doing is uh, advertising the brand more than the actual game. The, the game is just an entryway, but what we want to establish is the Fluffy Knockout brand and, you know, if you play one game, you want to move on to the next one uh, under the same, same name and it's better to push that first and just say, hey, we're working on this game, this is coming out, but this is who we are. By the time we're done, people see fluffy knuckle duster colours, which are hard to miss, and know it's going to be a funny game. That's the, that's the aim, that's the goal. Um, the same, you know, that's why we've got farting dragons like our little slug friend here. Um, whizzed off won't be remembered for whizzed off, it's that, oh, it's that game with the farting dragons, and people were, oh yeah, that one, yeah, I know that one. It's, it's so ridiculous that, you know, you can't really mistake it. If you've seen Wizard Off before, it's like, oh yeah, Farting Dragons. I gotcha. Um, another big help with this was actually Walter Tishkovitz. Um, you may have heard of his YouTube channel, Thunder Humor. They do really, really funny animations and have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Uh, they're all over social media. They've got a lot of followers on Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, I am a huge fan of Walter's videos. Uh, Walt, uh, Thunder Humor is a partnership between Walter and his brother. Walter, however, does the most amazing voices. He's just hilarious. He's a Swedish guy, and <laughs> every single one of his videos has me in tears. So I, I just, on a whim, I thought I'd contact him and say, I really love your videos. I'm making a video game. Would you want to do a voice part in it? And I was expecting to you know, have to pay for his services because he is a professional voice actor. And very, very luckily, he said, oh, send me some of, some of the, what you're working on. And I sent him the concept art of the dragons, or the farting dragons. And apparently he laughed until he cried and said, oh, I'm happy to, to do what you want with this. And I said, what were you charged? And he goes, no, no it's, it's free. You guys are starting up. It's, it's great. I want to help out. Which was really nice. It was a big break. And he's happy to help promote the, the game as well because he's doing the voice in it. You may have, uh, you would have heard his voice in the trailer. He's got a very unique accent and, and great way of doing really strange and wacky, wonderful voices. So he's waiting in the wings as well to say, I, I helped with this game, you guys should go to check it out. So little things like making connections that sort of really can help kickstart a project like that. And being a free-to-play game, and if it's just a slight mention of, hey, oh, that's right, I, yeah, it, is, it is free. <laughs> yeah, it, if, you know, I, I did a voice for this, you should check it out, it will just be a quick search on your phone and you found it and it's on the phone already. Yeah. So it's something slight like that can be a massive boost in uh, pro uh, like sales and visibility. Let me, let me tell you, going from a game, a PC game that sells for $25 to releasing a game for free after working on it for a year, that was a big jump. I, I don't know how that's going to work out yet, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah. We'll see. Everyone else is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you got to try these things. But yeah, as Nathan said, if a game's free, and somebody that they respect online says, I'm in this, you should get it. It's free, it's, you know, no loss. It. They're probably going to download it, um, just especially if it's funny. And, you know, Walter's channel is very funny. It's funnier than our stuff. 
<laughs> we'll get so, there. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I when going through a project like this, if you're building a brand with you know your company, you want to be a programming things and building art assets that you can reuse and templates that you can just move over for the next project make everything faster so if it takes a bit longer to do now and make it faster later on then you've got to do that so and especially for things like um, menu, like structures. Men menu structures especially for my side of things I made it in a way so all the animations would feel exactly the same it would just be a plop in your buttons tell it the things already in there you just tell it what to do maybe like a 10 minute 10 minutes of coding and everything's set up for a new menu and it's all connected so it doesn't have, you don't have to worry about what state the game is in or it doesn't have to talk to each other as, as much that's all built in because that's how I set it up I spent, spent maybe four times as long as I should have on one menu to make a menu that can work over and over and over again and by the same token every time I set up art assets I'll actually make them modular so that I can change hues change layouts and complete with his code open in a module when we make our next game the coding is done it's just changing a few values I change a few templates to make it look to theme to the new game and everything just works so while this game has taken 14 months to make the next game might take six months and then there's stuff that's done for that one that will be recycled again in the next one we're just trying to make our lives easier the more projects that we get out there we're starting from scratch with this one but we don't have to on the next one and the best thing about that is with with the brand, you want this everything to feel exactly the same. That fluffy yeah. knuckle dust to feel. Yeah, if you if you're going from one game, you want to be able to know what to expect on the next game. You want to go in and just even just by the slight feels of, feelings of like the physics or the menu moving in, you want to feel like oh yeah, this is just like that other game. Mm. A brand is more than a set of colors and a funky logo. A brand is how it feels. It's a bit like a, an eye device. You know, it's an eye device just because of all of the design that goes into it, not just aesthetics. You know that a Microsoft product is a Microsoft product because it blue screens your computer. You know? <laughs> There's those brand name feels that you just look for and you feel and you, you it's almost, you, you wouldn't even be able to put them into words necessarily, you just know that something comes from that place. Uh, and you know, it, it, we do a lot of work to, to start that out and every game that we do will refine that more and more and more. And like every company, you've got to start somewhere. WizDoff is where we're starting out. Uh, five years from now, we'll probably have f five to ten games out, and that fear will be established in our products, and people can come to expect it. You know, the thing is, you picked WizDoff because it was just more complicated as well. You know, There's a lot more aspects to it, so every hiccup that we will get to, we get through in one project. Mm. And the next game we're making, Bouncing Brendan, is very is simple. so simple. And it will just be, it will be so much easier to get through than this because I've hit every single speed bump that we'll find in most of the games that are in that. Because <coughs> you have to remember this, this model that we're doing, this two-man model, was an experiment. It was a social experiment. It wasn't expected that we would actually go through and complete a project this polished in the end. It, it, I was half expecting it to fail because all I've seen everywhere are teams of six, eight, 12, 20 people where they've got three designers, five artists, three programmers working on these games and you hear about disagreements happening or one person thinks it should be done one way, the design documents changed or um, producers will come in and say, my daughter's really into ponies at the moment, make the whole game about ponies. Um, that sort of thing can happen and we'd, I thought, let's simplify it, let's cut out the offices, let's cut out all the extra staff and just do this. I didn't think it would work. I wasn't that naive. I mean, there's a reason that things happen the way they do, but it did, and I really think it's just luck, mainly. We've just, I found a really good guy. And you scared off a couple? I did scare <laughs> off a couple before Nathan. Nathan and I did not just magically fall together. There were two before Nathan. They did not choose to proceed. <laughs> I'm not the easiest person to work with. Anybody that's ever worked with me knows this. So, <laughs> but um, I can acknowledge it. But I'm, I'm still. You can acknowledge it. Yeah. But we have genuinely had no arguments in the entire production of this game. Fourteen months. Fourteen months. Mm. Not a single. Not even a heated discussion. Mm. Nothing. Because every time one of us brings up a counterpoint, we justify it, and the other person mm. will justify their standpoint. We made that clear from the beginning. 
that yeah. that's how it's going to be. It's kind of like it's a marriage with a really thorough encyclopedic prenup. <laughs> that's what it's like. And it's not if it's not our domain, we just suggest it. It's like here's another option. I let you yeah. figure out whether that's an option worth going for. See, I'm also a coder. If I'm standing behind him and looking at him coding, and I'm like, you, you're doing that? <laughs> he goes, yep. And that's it. That's the end of it. That, he gets the last say. It's code related. That's him. If he looks at a picture I'm doing going, those colors? I just say, yep. And then I'll say, why? And he'll tell me. And sometimes, and a lot of the times, for both of us, we've said, Actually, I didn't notice that. It's a really good point. Because we justified it, it didn't turn into an argument. And a lot of things that Nathan has suggested are now in the game for the design side of things. And a lot of code optimizations that I've suggested are in the game in the code, in the back end. Just because Nathan did, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, that comes down less to organization and more to just social dynamic. You've got to have the right people for that. And, and that, that's why Nathan's number three. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, trust. Trust is a big one. And respect. Mm. Alright, so, the polish phase, as we talked about. The horror phase. The phase that will test you and make you decide, do you really want to be a game developer? Is this really what you want to do? <laughs> you could stay in this phase forever, we have, we have since learned. It's easier on a PC game, you've got more screen space, things don't have to be as clean. Well, they should be, but they don't have to be. Mobile game, if things aren't clean and neat and crisp and perfect, it just collapses. People don't know how to use it. They'll say, what is this? So they get confused. So they put the game down, and you never want somebody to put a mobile game down. It's easy to get a free game and then not like it and leave a one-star review. It's, it's a lot easier than buying a game. Mm. Or spending money on an app purchase. You, you can put no research into a game, get it, not like it, send it away. And that... By no means it, sh it should not be put down at all. It, that is polish. Yeah. You can have the most solid concept. That that prototype phase that we talked about, where it sort of blocks on the screen, that can be as fun as anything. That can be a, as a, so addictive that you just have the com genuinely have the conversation of we should just release this. You know, let's just put this out. This will be great. Um, and that can be as fine as anything. But if you have not polished it and rounded it off and, and made it beautiful. Make it something genuinely beautiful that you are proud of. Why would the players be proud to play it? Why would they think it's beautiful if you don't? But there is a line. I could quite happily keep nitpicking the projects until 20 years from now. You know, Nathan and I, and I would sitting be long there. Gone. You know, he would have had grey hair <laughs> just from stress, not from age. I'm sure he all age well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And I would still be nattering about it. But the thing is, because I, I do this, I, I make games full time and I don't sleep very much. I get about four or five hours sleep a night. I just, I'm wired like that. I forget sometimes what time it is and will start updating the Trello with more polish items for Nathan. And Nathan always keeps his phone on loud. So mm. he gets woken up at 4 a.m. and he's like, oh God, Alex is playing the game again. <laughs> and it can get really demoralizing because like, what were you telling me about the 12 items you completed? Oh yeah, you'd, for a polish phase you'd just have you know, 12 items up there nice and simple, nice and like polished things are you can just pump it out, pretty you quick. can go through them pretty quickly you spend a day going through the entire list of things, that's done that's done, I can move on to the last few things and because it's a real sense phase, of accomplishment really yeah, you feel really accomplished there's only a few items left and once I do that there's not much of the game left and then you'll do that, you set it down, go to bed, wake up the next day, there's 16 items. <laughs> and that will just go 16 on. 16 new items on top of the 12 that he'd already finished. Yeah, and that will just go on, this you would know, happen day daily. after day yeah. for a couple of weeks. And that's just how it goes. I mean, you could just shoot out like 50 items for me, but that's hard to just go through. You've got to pace yourself and feel like you've accomplished something. You've only got a little bit more and then just stretch it out a little bit more. And a little bit more, but know when to stop. I think my record was 36 new Trello cards in one day. Yeah. Um, that was in a two hour session playing the game. And I didn't hear from Nathan for a couple of days after that. <laughs> I, think I, I think he's like, I need a break. I need to just step away from the code a little bit. Because he had just polished off about 15, 16 items and was feeling good. So, and I mean. That's where the demoralizing comes in. It's 
you know, you feel like you're so close and there's just like a few items left and you pump through those. It's like running on a treadmill. Yeah. You're not getting anywhere. Yeah, you, you feel like you're not getting anywhere. If that, if that drags on for a bit too long, you've, you lose kind of your drive. Mm. But I mean, the, the, the polish, you've got to find the line. There is a line, but you've got to find it and you've got to tow it for, you know, the whole, the, as, as long as you're willing to tow it for. I mean, you look at games like Half Brick put out, they are so refined, so polished. I mean, Fruit Ninja is a really simple game. Anybody worth their weight and salt could, could pump out Fruit Ninja, but to make it that polished is an art form. It is beautiful. Everything is designed perfectly, the colours are matched perfectly, and it's the polish that makes people stay hooked. I mean, it's a good concept, great concept, but that polish is what makes it a beautiful thing. And it's, it's sort of like peeling that protective layer off a screen when you first take it home, and you're just going, ooh, you know, that feeling, that's, that's what a good game gives you. It's like, oh, that's just so smooth, everything's just perfect, you know. That's, that's what you want to try and go for, and that's what your polished phase will get. It's just and, simple things, like when we were displaying it at uh, Game On, it was just people going to the top of the tower and then wondering why they couldn't kill the wizard. I mean, how can we just tweak that without having to blare words at them? How can we just tweak that slightly and polish that to kind of, you know, tell them that that's not, that's not where they should be in the first place? It's, you know, let's just add some fireballs here. An ideally designed game should not have to have a tutorial. It hmm. should just flow. It should reward the right behaviour, punish the bad behaviour, gently. Hmm. Um, but. You know, you, you learn as you go and you refine and you get people to test it and you get feedback. And don't be afraid of the feedback as well because sometimes the feedback's really harsh. Um, take that as a lesson and, you know, find the line and, and dance on it. So we did run into a few unexpected hurdles with this one. <laughs> yeah, the, the third party plugins were a bit of a struggle for me. I've never done anything like that before. I wasn't really sure how to approach it. And a lot of the times it would not exactly communicate with uh, the online aspect of um, you know Facebook, Facebook and Twitter and mm. couldn't really understand why and then occasionally it would ju it would fully post the picture and everything would be okay and then it wouldn't ever again without even changing code yeah and it was a massive struggle that went on for a while and then we just had to you know this he says a while like it's not that long it was months yeah and months. it was just Something wasn't going on. I couldn't exactly pinpoint where everything was going wrong. And at some point, even though Facebook and Twitter, social interactions are extremely important, sometimes time is more important. And doing a soft launch and not throwing yourself out there and then putting social media in there, just doing a quiet launch and then if, as things are out there and everything's picking up, if you want to do an update after that, then that might be the better way to go. Mm. It's just, you've got to get the game done before these things that you feel are extremely important get in there. It got to the point where, it, I can tell how stressed Nathan is by how swoofy his hair is. You see how immaculately held together his hair is right now? It's incredible, it's a work of art. But it starts getting tussled the more stressed he is. Just one hair at a time will start hanging down over his face. And I remember one day uh, we were picking him up for something <coughs> and there were three hairs out of place. And there was a, a look in his day. eyes. It was like a thousand yard stare. This was like <laughs> three months into working on getting social media working. Yeah. And I said, maybe we should just drop it for now. I'd do it as a post-launch update. I, it's not that big a deal to be able to share your high score in the, in, on Facebook in the game for mm -hmm. right now. I'd rather- For this game. For, for this game. We can get the game out, focus on the gameplay. You know, the game's working, everything's playable. It's just this one thing is driving him mad. And I'd looked at it as well, he'd given me the code. I could work out why it wasn't working. It was something to do with that plugin, it was just driving us mad. Uh, sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't work. Sometimes you would think it would post once, you run the code once, and 20 pictures go up and shared on, on the, the same screenshot. Just driving us mad. So we decided to just drop it. Not the best decision for the project, but really had to be done. Sometimes time's more important. Yeah, we would be sitting here for another three months trying to get it working, and, uh, potentially, or more. Uh, so post-launch update, we'll have the social media. And sometimes if something's holding you back that much, you just gotta drop it. Um, the balancing of the game was a big one, but getting the movements right. Um, a game can be too difficult, or it can be too easy, and you can't just 
go on your own instincts on that. Um, Nathan is fantastically good at fighting games, for example. You put him in Street Fighter. He's been in tournaments of Street Fighter. If I play him, I die in seconds. I've been in tournaments of Quake 3 Arena. He would die in seconds. But if I'm playing Wizzed Off and I'm finding it perfectly easy, that doesn't necessarily mean I could hand it to somebody else and they would find it easy. Like, we might not even be the core audience. We might even just have pure luck and every tester that we've got is just really good at joust-style games, you know, to, to find that balance. And the in-game currency, you can actually buy it in the game for real money if you want to unlock costumes and all the, you know, the normal stuff, your, your game developers, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but can they collect those coins too fast? Can, are they too slow? Is there enough of a sense of reward for the amount of work that you have put in in a level? All of that needs just refinement and refinement, and it really helps when you've got someone like Nathan who can just link in the spawn rate of coins to a value and just give you a set of constants, and I can just open up the code and go through and change all the constants until it feels right. Um, and that process has actually gone on from the beginning. We never stopped balancing until it felt right. From the moment you could actually do pickups in the game and, and get scores um, to the end of the polish phase, we just kept going at it and going at it because it is more of an art than a science. Uh, and we, <laughs> when it came to how the game ran, I don't know I, I don't know if Nathan always agreed with me on this, but I, I really didn't want to drink the Kool-Aid when it came to design features of the game, the way things were laid out. You'll, I noticed a trend in a lot of mobile games coming out with the way that the, the menu structures work, the way um, even some of the graphical assets and, and, and things were starting to look the same. Everyone would go for that retro 8-bit look or everyone would go for another look. And it was just sort of different games from disjointed studios that weren't connected in any way all started looking the same. Different game, but everything but the game looked identical. And I was determined to just define our own style. I mean, especially when we're pushing the brand this hard, we need a look. And so, uh, <laughs> rebelling against it. Like I said, we'll learn whether or not that is a good decision or a bad decision, but that is why we're doing this game first. And that's all about establishing a brand as well. I mean, that was all associated with certain games and, you know, it's recognised as, oh, that's similar to that game. Mm. Uh, and we, we didn't really think uh, that these things would be as difficult as they were. Uh, you, you sort of you start out projects like this with a lot of hope, but um, it you know it it'll learn you. Yeah. <laughs> um, passing builds around was a big one as well. Getting uh, getting test flight to work was fun. I thought it would be a lot simpler than it was. Yeah, it was a uh, plugins again. They just didn't like uploading that at all. Mm. They just weren't happy with it, so I just had to remove everything and send it over and as a just a simple project and Android was just easy it was just you know build it send it over with my extremely slow upload speed which took which basically shut down my internet access for about two hours yeah. while I uploaded this mobile game but you can just stick an APK file in Dropbox and send, it, send somebody a link and they can have it on their phone it's super straightforward super in, unsecure and, and all that I understand why Apple does what they does Mm. That's what they do. <laughs> um, but when you're trying to just test with some internal people, it's so, Android makes it so much easier. Yeah. Um, but I imagine once we've figured it out, future games are going to just be like butter. It'll be really simple. Uh, it's just a matter of working out all these provisioning profiles and, and Putting other nonsense. Putting third-party stuff. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just uh, after doing Android only until now, it's been real sort of slap in the face. So, that, that is the game. Um, it will be coming out quite soon. We're actually at the point now, Nathan's... Just optimising now. Yeah, yeah. Na Nathan solved all the iOS crises that we were having, and yeah. um, we're just doing as much optimising as possible to make it work on as early devices as possible, just so that the, the as many people can play it as possible. Um, the earliest device we want to support is the iPhone 4. Yeah, um, I think I've got a 4S. 4S, that's, that's, yeah. As soon as I get it working, and I'm happy with how it is on there, that's as optimised as I think we need We need to go and in, just move on. In terms of the Android build, we've got it running on those really dodgy Android tablets from the post office. You know, those ones that are like 80 uh, bucks? Yeah. Yeah, it works on those, so it's pretty good. But iOS, different story. There's a lot of extra overhead that the, the 
Apple package comes with. So once that's done, it's going out. And we're doing, uh, we've heard all of the horror stories um, where if you don't launch on iOS first, uh, they won't feature you as easily or something like that. We've heard all sorts of horrible stories about that where you don't get as much screen time, you don't get as much attention as you might get if you were to do it sort of exclusive for them first. They don't mind what you do once you have launched on Apple. Um, but the plan is to go out iOS first, get that out there, leave it a month, then an Android release. That seems to be the way that everybody else is going. Um, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> so, uh, does anybody have any questions for us at all? Uh, back to what version of iOS are you supporting? Technical um, question. <laughs> I think currently I'm just going 9.2 and then rolling back until... Oh. We have had an 8.3 device work running it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to try 7, but I think 8.3 might be our limitation. Yeah, because I think like 15% of iOS users are still on um, 8. Mm. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I just want to try and get it working on the 9.5 and then oh, yeah. roll, black, uh, roll, roll back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, just baby steps at a time. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we'll go past like, yeah, 8, eight if I can, 7 yeah. possible, but you don't want to waste too much time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it's like 2% on 7 or something. Yeah. Yeah. They can You've got to get your seven. audience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they, can, they can upgrade just for us. That's right. right. <laughs> they should. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions at all? Yeah. Uh, did you work in Dropbox or did you have a version control system? Like I had a version control system. I still have uh, linked up to the Dropbox. So it's saving... Uh, it, it's keeping revision systems linked to that Dropbox, but uh, so everything's linked up between Alex and I. Like, I just handle that because Alex isn't going to get, uh, he's gonna, not going to branch off that at all. My transfers are just in a um, series of organized folders of different areas of the game, different assets. Um, yeah. yeah, so mine's purely just so I can roll back on my end because, you know, I'm just doing the, the, the tech side. So that's just my safety precautions. The only thing I have access, access to is the latest build, whatever yeah, the latest build that's is. That's all you'll get. And then I'll, I'll put it, yeah, that's right. I'm not allowed to delve further than that because that's his side of the business. Yeah. He'll call me in if he needs me. <laughs> yeah. Yo. So it's not on Android yet? Not yet. Uh, well, it does work on Android. It's yeah. Just, it's not on the store. I haven't released so on the store. So we have to yet. get iOS on first. And, and is it ads to monetize? No, uh, well, there are well, in-app well, purchases. The way it's actually set up is um, you can collect gold coins in the game, and you use those to buy the in-app purchases. If you want to speed that along, you can buy a chunk of those coins, or um, every round that you play, you can find up to four jigsaw piece puzzles. If you find all four jigsaw piece puzzles, which is very easy, they actually tend to spawn in your path, so it's, it's very easy. But if you find all four, you can watch a video to get a hundred gold coins. If you find three, you can watch a video to get 75, 2, 50, etc. Okay. So um, it's like you're working towards getting the monetization. A game with kind of, game. You just have to... Sitting through the ad is almost like feeling rewarding. Like, I, I, I got this, I earned this ad, and I'm going to get 100 coins for this. Uh, I actually have a really weird ethical thing which will probably hit me in the wallet further down the track, but I don't believe in a game that you cannot grind for what you want. There is nothing in the game that you can't get without just working at it. There's no nothing that's unrealistically priced or anything like that. If you just want to have a free game and just really sit down and play it, no fluffy knuckle duster game will ever not follow that pattern. I, I really want, I don't like the, the enforced thing. And that's why the ads aren't enforced. You can find those jigsaw puzzles and you will get point bonuses for just capturing them. But you can then choose to watch a video if you want. I, I really don't like the in-your-face monetization stuff. If people want to play our game just for fun and play it for free and never have to pay money for it, that's great. They might do. They might buy something on the next game, but they they get to know Fluffy Knuckle Dust stuff. The getting them playing the game and laughing is genuinely more important to us. So it's not like uh, Clash Royale or uh, where you're restricted. To, oh, you could keep playing if you want, but you're not going to get anything out of it. Sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it doesn't become unfairly balanced or anything like that. It's, it's nothing. I mean, the it's things just aesthetics. The things that you can buy in the game are um, mostly costumes for the, the, the two characters, uh, Sir Stephen and his goose steed James. Um, and you can retexture the tower as well to make that look different. But you can also buy power-ups, which will last for the entire round. Things like resurrection or um, there's a glass orb which will protect you until it shatters. So you can take a, absorb a certain number of hits. And if people want to get the really high scores, 
those power-ups will really help them get in there or give them that added edge. And there's also a whole lot of different ways to just win those outright. Yeah. Like, it's not just you, you can only buy them. There's a mini-game where you can win them and things like that. But if people want to chase the high score, they need coins. They, they, can, they can just grind for it if they want. And some people might just get uh, impatient. And the fact is, the lowest rung, rung purchase, 99 cents, is um, actually enough coins to buy something like five costumes, um, two power-up rounds, mm. and uh, a new tower skin. It's 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 quite generous with it. If you buy the most expensive one, I think it's three ninety nine, and it gives you enough gold coins to just be able to buy out everything. Yeah, and still a... keep buying power-ups for a good fifty, sixty rounds. And it's kind of a trial for us as well. Like we don't want to, you know, catch a whale that just keeps bringing in big lots of money and keeps buying the big power-ups it's kind of we want to make it very tempting for a lot of people to just say hey you know 99 cents is all right i'll get all the costumes i want i might buy kevin the slightly helpful pigeon yes uh, the biggest power-up is kevin the slightly helpful yeah. pigeon he's slightly helpful he lives up to his name in every way but he's permanently slightly helpful so he really doesn't do much but he does a little and his heart's in the right place. So he's, the, he's 50,000 gold coins, which sounds like a huge amount, but probably if you were to play the game for a solid 20, 25 hours, you'd probably be able to get that. Yeah. Unless you're really good at the game, and then you'd probably get that in five hours. Yeah. Some but, people at that game on exhibition, some people were obscenely good at the game. They just oh, got yeah. reflexes like you wouldn't believe. I would not want to play them in Need for Speed. Mm. <laughs> But yeah, we just want to kind of branch out and kind of a reasonable price for everyone instead of just... And everything optional. Yeah, and everything optional. So a lot of people are tempted, but not just trying to catch in that one person that's just, yeah, I'll spend money on we this, haven't even and then I'll spend money on ads. that, and then I'll spend money on that. Yeah, people don't want to see advertising, they don't have to see advertising. Yeah. It's up to them. We're trying to be nice. We'll see how it works. Trying to. It may not work. We may be naive as hell, but we're going to try. We're going to go out being naive. Yeah. Any other questions? I was going to say, it sounds, so it sounds very experimental, your, both mm. the company and the game. Yeah. Uh, what were your kind of expectations of, um, of results? Like, uh, yeah, well, to be honest, I wanted it to be the, the cleanest possible development cycle. Like I said before, when you've got a larger team, it, it tends to lead to disagreements and arguments, and uh, you'll, you'll get people that are uh, clearly an expert in their field but if you've got three people that are clearly an expert in the same field especially in IT is a lot of <laughs> very very rare to find three people that will actually have exactly the same ideas and agree on everything it's, I mean if you've ever been in a development team before in a, in a like an office style business it it almost gets gets to blows sometimes with some people and there's the age-old clash between the design side of the business and the development side of the business. They don't see eye to eye. And I thought, it can't, I mean, all this software keeps getting pumped out around the world every year. So something must work somewhere. So I wanted to, to strip everything back and see how minimalist it could possibly be. And I mean, we worked, but like I said, that was due to a very lucky personality match. I mean, there were two people before him, um, one that I got rid of and the other one left. <laughs> um, but I know that it's just luck. And why not, I say? Because, I mean, if you can't find the right bunch of people to work with, I'm not saying that you only need two people to make a game. It worked for us. We're making very simple games. Wizzed Off is the most complicated thing in our list of games that we're going to make, and it's pretty simple. It's Joust with farting dragons. Um, so two people are, is all that's needed to make that game. If you were making something like Skyrim, two people making that would be doing it for about 30 years. But unless you saw, what was it, Project Blue Spark back like 10 years ago? That was two people, they did, they did all right, but some people are freaks, like us. Yeah. But um, it's finding the right people is what matters. A lot of people throw all these preconceived notions at game development, like, oh, we need to have an office space, we need to have a core room, and everyone needs to be in that room when we're working on the game. We need to have open discussion where everybody gets a say in everything and, and you know, fairies and rainbows shoot through the windows. It doesn't work like that. Nathan is very good at coding. I can, I can code, but Nathan is very good at coding. I'm very good at design. I'm happy to say it. Anybody that knows me knows I'm happy to say it. I'm a good game designer. Nathan is not. He knows it. Yeah. 
I know that I'm not as good a coder as Nate I is. I can make suggestions, but I yeah. know my place. But he knows his place, I know my place. I don't walk over to his computer and tell him how to code. If I do, he is welcome to just tell me to bugger off, and I just listen. And being able to be objective like that is why it works. That, finding that, finding two people, or worse if you had a team of three, five, eight, twelve people that are able to be objective and stick to their field and just do their field, the thing that they are good at, that's hard to find that many people. So I started with two because finding one other person that can do that, I knew I could do it, but finding one other person, I figured that's going to be the easiest one to start with. I mean, I'd been making malevolence by myself and I'd done that because I didn't think that there were other developers like that. And then doing that talk and meeting his friend Dylan, I, I realized, oh, maybe there are. And Nathan is it. So the experiment was that, and the expectation was that it would we would eventually break that system. We would eventually want to, you know, put in put our ore into the other person's work because you know Nathan has ideas for design. I have ideas for code. Eventually, that would eat at us. One of us might just walk away bitter one day, and that just comes back to bite us later on. Yeah, something, something might happen. I mean, we've all had that one scrum. You know, everyone's been in that one scrum where there's you were supposed to talk about 12 items and you started talking about one and eventually the manager said, let's just go to our desks, shall we? We'll talk about this later. Um, that happens in, in teams. But when you know your place and you're willing to actually do it, which takes a lot of being, you know, yeah, it's, it's a combination of being really, really humble and really, really determined. Well, what's the word I'm thinking of? Pr I don't know. Proud? Oh, no <laughs> Confident, yeah. yeah. I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm bad at. Thank you. Nathan knows what he's good at, and he knows what he's bad at. And he leaves it at that, and I leave it at that. We happen to be the jigsaw puzzle pieces that fit together. If you had a team of five, that's more complicated jigsaw puzzle, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. If you have somebody that is a really good sound designer, knows nothing about code or design, don't let them have a say in code or design. We're not living in the Teletubby world where everybody should get a say. If you are an expert in a field, you should get a say in that field. If you are not an expert in that field, shut up. That's, that's how a good, clean project works. Unfortunately, very rarely goes down that way. So I was expecting it to not go down that way. That was my expectation for the, ex expectation for the project. I picked WizD off because it was one of the more complex ideas that, of the array of ideas that I had that I wanted to turn into a mobile game, simply because it was the one that had the most things that could go wrong, the most things that would cause arguments, especially with humor. Humor is usually so subjective, um, and that's why we went with farts. Find me a person that hasn't got at least <laughs> had a fart at some point in their life, you know. So it's, it's usually a pretty universal humor thing. but. Everything that you see was not just, let's try this, you know? It was meticulously thought out and How did you make executed. The part sounds? It was actually me. <laughs> I, I, no pun intended, I shit you not. It was actually me. Did you shit us not? <laughs> I came close on the splug fart because it does go for about nine seconds. He freaked out his dog with the, the pigeon sounds. There is a recording on the Dropbox of a fart sound where the dog goes nuts. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was me. Not, not always an actual fart, but uh, not, always. not always. No, a lot of like this and mouth action and things like that. But it's yeah, the sounds the sounds in it are me. The wizard at the top of the tower is Benson here. Um, you, you, you hear him as you get closer, he just constantly rambles on in an inane language, like he's really, really furious about something. But, yeah, I mean, the sound design was part of the design, so that was just me. I just send Nathan wave files and he has to deal with it. So, all right, where's it going? Open this up. Oh, more farts, great. All right, <laughs> file that away on the Dropbox. And Fart number 43. All right, yeah. I think there were 68 different ones total. Um, Walter was actually great. He, uh, I gave him a script. He completely ignored it. He, he got the vibe of what the script was, where the script was going, and he sent me an hour-long MP3 of him. Just He locked himself in his room and just rambled in the voice of this wizard sort of character. 
rambled for an hour and sent me an MP3. I had to go through and listen to this thing over and over again to find the right slices. Oh, this line works there. And, and he was making fart noises and all sorts of things and making the voices of the monsters and things. And it's just hilarious. He got into it. He got enthusiastic about it. And it, it was his field. I, I just gave it over and said, you do this, this voice. We, we, we need you to do this voice. And I didn't correct him on any of it. He, that was his in, interpretation of it. And he was a professional voice actor. Why do you, yeah. why would you, um, I, I gave him a description. He matched the description. That was his feel. And everybody that's been involved has been the same way. But yes, my expectation was that it would fail. It did not. It worked so well that we have now got 23 more design documents. Yeah. We riff off each other so much that we'll just come up with something that makes us both piss ourselves laughing. And then say, we've got to write this down. This is a great game idea. And then later on, because I've got nothing but spare time, I, I write it out as a full design document. And we have a lot of really, really funny ideas lined up. Our next one is called Bouncing Brendan. It's about a morbidly obese penguin that wishes he could fly. Um, it's, there's this tiny little fat penguin, but that's going to be fun in its own right. Um, what, what some of the other ones? Piggly Wings, about a flying pig, all the sorts of things. Middle-aged things. man screaming down a street. Yep. Sometimes they're just... Game in that. If it makes us laugh, we figure it's got to be something good. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions at all? Looks like no. Good. Well, we've actually got the game with us, even though it's not out in the store. But if you'd like to have a play of it, you know, you're welcome to come over and, and have a play. But uh, otherwise, thanks for thanks for coming out and listening Thank to us much. ramble. And give us a like and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. Well done. Um, Benson, our morale consultant will be available for any high fives. We've brought him along to be at your disposal for the evening. Don't be nice to him. If you feel like a high five, he will provide one free of charge. It will be crisp. <laughs> Guaranteed crisp. Does he have the free high five sign? He does not. He no. is the free high five sign. <laughs> you see a Benson, you know what's going on. Yeah. So on your way out, grab your, your fly, your silicone wristband, and your high five. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, yes.